45, 40, run, William, run! He's got blockers in front, five, touchdown! Joshua Crib! He snapped back, ball down, can't block. block! They blocked the kick! This is the Orange is Orange or Browns podcast, part of the Press Play Podcast Network. I'm your host, Chase Smith, and with me, as always, Browns insider, Jeremy Powell. Jeremy, what's up, my man? How was your bye weekend? Chase, what's up, man? Really good. Got to uh, watch a lot of football still. Had a great weekend and looking forward to the game this weekend. Good, good, good. And with us as well, she's your favorite and our favorite Emmy-nominated digital content producer at News Channel 5, ladies and gentlemen, Cameron Justice. Cameron, how was your weekend? Pretty busy, but, you know, we got through it. On to Sunday. And this is going to be a special episode. We're going to be covering the Browns at the bye. And here to help us do that, he's done it twice before this is now his third appearance. He now holds the belts for the most appearances on the Orange is Orange or Browns podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Zach Jackson of The Athletic. Zach, thanks for joining us again, man. I'm the heavyweight champ, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually yes. his fourth time, on, fourth time on the show. <laughs> wow. Fourth time. Yep, fourth yeah. time. Well, I didn't get any skinnier on the bye weekend. I know that. So. <laughs> right. Um, but I'm, I'm rested and I'm ready and We'll see. I mean, you're gearing up to cover significant games rather than cover another coaching search. So that's progress yes. and, and we'll see what happens. Or, or a draft, right? Not looking ahead yeah. to, uh, <laughs> to no the mock draft. drafts yet. <laughs> Before we hit to our Texans preview episode here in a couple of days, Zach's going to help us look at the first half of the season reactions, any highlights, uh, kind of what has happened so far in the first eight, nine weeks in the NFL. Then we're going to talk about where we stand. Currently, what's the status of the team and the second half predictions? Zach, you've been covering the team for a long time. You work for him before you covered him. Um, how has the first couple weeks of this season uh, been different compared to other Browns teams that you've covered? Well, they've won five, right? Um, <laughs> they're building some real strengths, and you know, you don't you don't want to jump to any conclusions one way or the other. Um, and you certainly, as long as the Haslam's are in charge, you know, don't want to say that you're here to stay or that anyone's here to stay right Mm -hmm. but like it's a young team it's a young coach it's the youngest gm in nfl history you already got miles locked up like again you you have an offense that's only eight games in and had the abbreviated off season but has a really good offensive line where most of the guys should should be around for a while right has a running the best running back stable in the league Mm-hmm. And get Nick Chubb back. Those guys should be around for a while. We'll see how that plays out. Like, you know, I'm really optimistic about the long-term future of the Browns. Now, what is long-term in the NFL? Can they make it last? I don't know. Um, right now, I'm worried about the defense having any chance. You know, the offense needs to get Chubb all the way back, needs to get Wyatt Teller all the way back, is going to miss Odell Beckham. But because you sit here and look at the chance to play significant games, the chance to make the playoffs and break the longest streak in the league and then really evaluate, have a real off season and keep guys in place so they can learn from their own mistakes and get a real gauge on where things are like, you know, winning beats the hell out of losing. Right. And like getting a chance to take that next step would be progress. So it's not all perfection. It's not all, they're not knocking on the door of winning championships, but I think anything other than a fairly optimistic, like wide picture, big picture view of this team um, is probably not the right one, you know? And and I think, you know, history doesn't matter when they go out there against the Texans or when they go out there against the Titans in four weeks. But, you know, even if you take the history into account, like, Hey, that's where there's real progress. They're going to chase a playoff berth. They're going to measure themselves against other teams that have either been in the playoffs or think they should be. And the continued evaluation of Baker Mayfield will go on in big games that matter. What else could you ask for on that front? Zach, question. So this may sound stupid at face value, but I think actually if you think about it, it may not be as dumb. Who do you think is a more important uh, getting back into the lineup this week, Wyatt Teller or Nick Chubb? More important for the progress of the team? Yeah, I mean, Jeremy, I think that's a fair question, and I'm not sure I have that answer. You know, no matter who's back there, your offensive line clicking – being on the same page and specifically mauling people as they did for three or four of those games early Mm -hmm. gives those guys a chance. Right. So Nick Chubb is one of the best football players in the national football league. He's not one of the best running backs. He's not one of the best young players. He is one of the best players. So I'm not trying to downplay anything of his 
um, return or, or answer any question about is he 80%, is he 90%, is he 102%, right? But you get your O-line back, you give yourself a chance, and they certainly missed Wyatt Teller. And I think Wyatt Teller kind of personifies what I talked about and where they're trying to get in that, okay, if we'd have done this in August, we'd have said, we know who 10 guys on the offense are going to be. We don't know who the right guard's going to be, right? Yep, yep. But if you have the right system and you have the right O-line coach and you're going to stick to that system, and the guys are going to evaluate for that system and in that system, then a player that just fits with his skill set and his upside and his potential being maximized, like that's how you get somewhere, right? And so I think Wyatt Teller is a super important player. I don't know if he'll go on to be the greatest right guard that ever lived. You know, I don't know that he'll go on and get a big money extension, although he's certainly in line for one. But I think three weeks from now, if the offensive line's rolling again, you'll look and say, Hey, in, in the X amount of games that Teller has played, this offensive line has been really good more than it's been anything else. Yeah, and I don't want to downplay the importance of Teller or Chubb, but I think having a Miles Garrett at 100 percent, which he wasn't ag- against Oakland or Las Vegas, I think that I don't want to say is more important, but I think is a conversation worth having. Cameron, what has been, uh, you know, something that's going to stick out to you the first half of the season here? The Browns at five and three. Yeah, I think. I mean, outside of getting all those guys back, which is super important. It's what the Browns have been missing these past couple of games where they've not looked their best. Uh, I think it's a, it's a real testament to, to Kevin Stefanski, these first couple games, how the Browns have looked early, how they've come together, how the team has, you know, fa- almost found themselves and labeled the identity. You've got Nick Chubb. He's back now, but he, I mean, he's kind of the identity of the offense. He is, what it should be centered around, you know, focusing on establishing that run game early and getting Nick Chubb those touches, then you got Kareem Hunt right behind him. uh, And that helps a lot. So I think, you know, the, the big, the big takeaway for me for these first couple of games is just seeing how well Kevin Stefanski has done. I know there was a lot of doubts, whether he was going to be able to step up first year head coach Browns have seen that before (laughs) there wasn't a lot, but well, not a lot of hope, you know, from a lot of fans. They, they wanted one of those proven coaches, the Mike McCarthy, they're on Vera. They wanted somebody else. Um, and now Kevin Stefanski filling that role. I think a lot of fans have been, you know, pretty excited to see what he's done. And I, I think he's done a very good job so far of, you know, making this team come together, building, building his foundation with the Browns for a long-term thing, because, I, th- I think that's a, a big focus for the Browns is making sure that you, you find that, that long-term thing, that longevity with the coaching in the front office and, you know, their buzzword of alignment. I think that they actually might have done it this time. So we'll see going into the next, next couple games, but so far so good from Kevin Stefanski. Zach, do you get a sense of that alignment that Cameron was talking about? I do. Um, and you know, it's, it's early and, and they've mostly done well. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think they would tell you that they, knew the offense was going to be stronger than the defense, but maybe the defense, maybe they misjudged a couple things there. But yeah, in terms of just like having guys on the same page and like letting plans come together, right? Like they knew they were getting Hooper, Conklin, and Case Keenum. Well, Case Keenum has the history with Barry. uh, I mean, with Stefanski, right? Like somebody signed off on let's use our resources on this, you know? Stefanski goes and gets Alex Van Pelt, who played in the league, who's coached in the league for a long time, gets him to come as offensive coordinator without calling the plays, goes and gets Bill Callahan, who he'd never directly work with, and lets him do his thing. Like Those are little things that are so much more important than us arguing or analyzing play calls, right? Which are going to, there's going to be some good ones and bad ones. Like, yeah, I, I think that there is a real vision for how do we get there. So I also think if you ask those guys away from the record, that maybe they're fully aware that this team isn't as close as maybe the final record's going to indicate. Mm -hmm. But I think that they could lay out the stages of, okay, after next off season, then we'll really know how far we are. And that, that in itself is huge progress because the answer for so long has been so far away. Zach, can you help those of us listening who doesn't really quite understand what an offensive coordinator does if they don't call the plays, like what did Alex Van Pelt sign up for when, when he said, yeah. so a long time ago, because the Browns do this every single year. Right. So a long time ago, I asked someone who I really trust, like what is the importance of the coordinators? And they just, they set the tone for everything you do. They, they run meetings, they communicate with players, they hire their own assistants 
and yes, they believe in their schemes and they lead the game plans, but they, they kind of just are so far up there and setting your whole, all these buzzwords about culture, right. And system and all of this stuff. So to go get Alex, who was going to get a chance to work with Joe Burrow, right. And to get him to come here and say, okay, you're going to oversee this. Baker's going to be a big part of this. And we're going to put in this offense where maybe you recognize some of the roots, but you've never directly done that here. That's huge. And yes, they paid him a lot of money. Right. And yes, he had family in Northeast Ohio, all that stuff. But like he could have coached Joe Burrow and been really comfortable. He chose to come here. You know, Bill Callahan, I don't know. He could work for anybody. Right. The fact that he could look at this head coach who's 30 years younger than he is and come sign on board and say, I want to take this on. And like, you're going to give me a chance to with a young tackle and bringing in a tackle and I'm going to get to work with a couple established guys. Like that's great. Right. So the, the little things are good. And, and again, you know, we know about some of the behind the scenes disasters through the years and we don't know, well, right. Now, not only are we day to day and everything right now in this COVID world, right. We don't know at the end of the year, you know, is somebody going to lobby for or against Baker or somebody going to lobby for or against Denzel Ward's mega extension. Right. I'm just, I'm not trying to get into this thing and throw them out there, but yes, for like, for once, if the Browns promised you alignment nine months in, are they giving you alignment? Yes. So your fan, listen to this watching every Sunday, you say, okay, that's good. Let's move on to the next thing. Yep. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, first half of the season moments. I want to talk about, uh, not at length, but maybe kind of rate your, um, from this list, your favorite, uh, most memorable or most important moment that's happened in the first uh, eight games or so. And I'm going to list them here. And Jeremy, we'll, th- we'll go to you first after I list it. And you, you can kind of tell me what sticks out in this list, all right? Sure. All right, here we go. Here's the seven. And I tried using chronological order. The fake pump fail, the first home game victory, the first half of the Cowboys game, the OBJ reverse, the four-game win, win streak, the Steelers smashing, and Baker's drive in game against the Bengals. Which of those kind of – first half of the season moments uh, sticks out to you the most? I'll say the four game win streak, just because we haven't seen it very often. And the fact that we looked like a competent NFL franchise and a competent offense with such a limited off season with a new coach and all the things that go into winning four games in a row in the NFL, which as we've talked about in the past, winning one game in the NFL is hard. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the Browns were able to, win four games under the first year head coach, you know, with all the situations, I know everyone's dealing with them, but with the situation we're in, I'd say the, to me, the biggest moment is the fact that we have won four games in a row in an eight game span to start a season. It, it was nuts. The, uh, the graphic before the Raiders game, Browns are three and zero at home. You're like, what? Like, that's just so not normal. Cameron, I'll, I'll go to you. And here's the deal. You can't pick the same one that uh, Jeremy picked. All right. So I'll read him again. <laughs> I wasn't going to. I already know. Honestly, I think the most important one was Baker's drive, that final drive in the Bengals game, just because mm-hmm. it came at such a pivotal moment. Everyone was talking about, is he is he capable of doing this? Is he capable of winning a game like this? You're going to have to rely on Baker's arm. He's going to have to win a game for the Browns eventually. And so it was at this at this peak moment where that was the talk. Those were the headlines. Uh, and he answered. And I think that was really big to show – and, and people will say, you know, I was against the Bengals, but the fact that it happened is, is it was really important and it was a really important time for it to happen. So I think that was a really big moment. Didn't necessarily reflect afterwards, you know, like there wasn't, there wasn't this long stretch of just complete success from him. But I think that was a moment that he needed in his progress and, it, and it's his progress is on the line this season. This is, they're looking at him right now. And it could have had a, a worse start to that game. I mean, that we, we've talked about that in our game recap. What an awful start, uh, especially after that Steelers uh, throttling we got. Um, pretty special. Zach, uh, do you have a, a most memorable moment that's not Jeremy or Cameron's? Yeah, so the fake punt was like five and a half seconds of summing up 22 years of Browns. <laughs> All right. So they re- they've recovered nicely, and, and that's the thing. Like, like they – we know the schedule it has been and is a big reason why they're going to get the opportunity to play big games, mm-hmm. but no apologies. They're going to get the opportunity to play big games and for all big picture evaluations and for all attempts to bury this history in 19 years of a playoff drought, you get a chance to do it. 
And if you get to 10 and six, you're probably going to do it. So you went five and three the first half. It was up. It was down. It was a little bit wild. I think it's going to be wilder in the second half. Mm -hmm. But I also think they can go five and three if they can cover anybody. And if they do that, they'll get in. So we'll see. You know, Zach, I think you touched on just kind of like the theme of the season. The Browns is how how they're able to, to remain stable. Uh, even amidst a chaotic game, they had an awful game against the Ravens start the season and they reeled off, you know, four straight and then they bounced out from that. The Steelers game, they got crushed and they were able to bounce back from that. Um, my, my I, one of my, I think, memorable, most important moments is that OBJ reverse uh, for a couple reasons. Um, I, I question Stefanski's play calling uh, and I still kind of do a little bit low key, um, but after a complete, like the most complete first half of football I've ever watched the Cleveland Browns play. That was a clinic and the Browns dominated every facet of that game. Um, and then to see it start to slip away against the Cowboys and, and that OBJ reverse that, that sealed the game um, it was a, you know, he had a huge day. Uh, I think that was where we really, you know, started to see the Browns confidence and their belief in each other. And even the coaching staff kind of come full circle and, um, I think we played the Colts after that, um, or the, uh, the, the Washington team after that, that was Col- it was, it was the Colts, Colts after the that Colts. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that was a great team and I mean, there's still a, a good team. And I think that was just really, really important. It was a crazy play. Uh, I, I forget who does this on Twitter. They'll do like the, the play, but they have circles and they'll like animate it and you can see the run and you see the lines where they were, um, that just looked insane. Uh, I forget who I saw that too. Sorry. I can't give you credit. Um, but I think that that was a, a, a play that removed everyone's conversation and narratives from why is Stefanski calling all these terrible plays because that one worked. Um, and Hey, we beat at that point, uh, underperforming Cowboys team. Now that's, that's who they are. Um, and I just think that was a, a game that we should have won after the first half. And we did, I, I just, it was really, really, uh, I don't know. It was, it was fun. It was fun. Um, before we go to where we are now, is there any other moments I'm missing? Zach, Cameron, Jeremy, am I missing any moments from the first half you guys want to talk about? Well, remember when Peoples Jones didn't field the kickoff in that Dallas game? <laughs> oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's different right there. And then you fast forward three weeks after that and Baker throws the ball right to the Bengals DB and he doesn't catch it. And Peoples Jones catches it and wins. So like there's going to be razor thin margins. And yeah, you know, I do believe that momentum and like, you win one of those and it, it can help you later. Maybe it'll even itself out later. Right. But like they're going to be razor thin margins and the experience of winning the fourth quarter of winning on a day when you don't have your best or you're down, whatever, you know, and, and honestly, when Baker starts 0 five in Cincinnati coming off his miserable performance in Pittsburgh, I'm like, Oh man, this thing's going to get dark real quickly. Yep. And he completes 22 in a row. Right. Yep. So yes, it's the Bengals. And yes, they did like three amazingly dumb things to keep the Browns in the game. <laughs> but the Browns stayed in the game. They won the game. The Browns have give, the Browns have forced their opponent to punt one time in two weeks, but they won one of those games, yep. right? So like nobody's perfect. Take it and move on. And there's a whole half of the season in front of them. And it yeah. felt like for so, so long, all those razor thin margins went against the Browns. For And, you know, to some degree, it still kind of feels that way. But it, it's just nice to see a little different turn. Jeremy, were you going to kind of comment? Yeah, I was just going to say maybe also the, the the Miles Garrett strip sack this year because I think maybe we don't beat yes. the Washington football team without that strip sack. Maybe we don't meet the Cincinnati Bengals without that strip sack. So I think also those moments, I mean, he's pr- got to be the best in the league now at the, you know, the strip sack, quote unquote. So I think maybe Miles Garrett developing into, yeah. you know, probably the best defensive player in the league is another big moment in the first eight games. We're going to talk about Miles here in a moment. Let's take a quick break, and we'll come back and talk about where we stand now and second half predictions. Hello, Brooks here with the Books with Brooks monthly book club podcast. We read one book a month, and then we talk about it. Books like Stephen King's The Shining or Where the Crawdads Sing by Delia Owens. If you're on the hunt for book recommendations and enjoy sparkling conversation, come read along with us and then listen in. Hey, the Roadman, Kenny Rota, join me and Dennis Maniloff on the Next Man Up podcast as we look at all the teams in the Buckeye State, the Browns, the Indians, the Cavaliers, the Buckeyes, and whatever's happening, you know we'll be talking about it here on the Next Man Up podcast. Hey, it's JD from the Hyman Podcast. Using a narrative storytelling approach, the Hyman Podcast was created to start conversations, conversations that need to be human. 
Week by week, I'll break down walls and barriers and make people wildly uncomfortable, all the while giving a voice to the voiceless and the marginalized. Consider this your personal invitation to be part of that conversation. All right, so the Browns are at the bye, and and I'm going to have to say probably the the biggest story coming out of the bye is just the team's health. Today reported uh, Chubb has been activated, Wyatt Teller is back, um, and I think isn't there – Oh, Hooper, Hooper is back. Um, Zach, is there any other narrative other than, hey, the Browns are getting healthy? Well, I mean, they were legit not ready to play in the mm-hmm. Raiders game. And I think it's an excuse, but the injuries had a lot to do with it. And, and not just those guys missing, but Kareem limping and Jarvis not being Jarvis, right? right. And just, you know, th- and that was before Miles had the ankle, then he had the knee, all of that stuff. So, um, you know, they, they come out, they have winnable games. You get a chance. You got to believe that like there's real honest evaluation and real open communication from coaches to front office, from coaches to players, right? That's a change. Mm -hmm. You got to believe there's a laser level of focus this week, um, both in terms of COVID protocols. Now that you're without Baker for a couple of days and getting everybody back. And these guys know that if you beat the Texans and the Eagles, like you're not in, but you're damn close. Right. So yeah, I, I mean, I expect the Browns to play really well on Sunday, and, and I we'll see. Assume, but if everybody gets to the game, which it looks like right now, like I expect them to win. And then where do you ride that momentum? What lesson comes from that? Did the defense take a step forward? Did the run game just get back to dominating? You know, I, we, we don't know now, but they're still in where every game is not only an evaluation, but it's a growing point. And I still think in December they can be a lot better than they are now. And, you know, they really should be better these next two games than they were two, three weeks ago. Yeah, man, definitely getting everyone who's been out back and those with other nagging injuries. Uh, Cameron, who's the most important Brown to to see the field, uh, at, you know, fully healthy? I know we, we talked about it a little mm-hmm. earlier, but like Zach and Jeremy, we're, we're both trying to discuss and figure out. I think it's between, I think it's between Wyatt Teller and Nick Chubb. I mean, like, and it's hard to tell which one is more important, but I mean, I've, I've been, you know, preaching that for, for a week since the season started, you, like establishing the run game, run the ball. Like that's the identity of the team. So uh, you, you do that well with Nick Chubb. He's the best player and one of the best players in the league. So of course you want him back. Uh, and that's really important to the offense and really important to Baker because it provides him the ability to run the ball and not overwhelm Hunt use Hunt in the mix, but also then spread that ball around. You don't have Odell for the rest of the season. You got to deal with that, but you have Austin Hooper back. So having Nick Chubb there as the central focus of the offense, I think is really good, a really good stabilizer for Baker Mayfield moving forward with this offense. But That doesn't discredit the importance of key defensive players. So as much as, you know, Miles Garrett being healthy, hundred percent, that's, that's major, obviously I'm not going to discredit that, but I think another one uh, that's, it's is exciting to see back is Jacob Phillips. Uh, I know that he's, he's young, but just that linebacking group, it, it's been, it's been a tough time for them this season. So I think just getting some, some health back to them and seeing what he's able to do, if he's able to get back out there, I think that's really big. Defense definitely can't get any worse. So all the, all the help, we can get Jeremy. Uh, let, let's talk about Nick Chubb, Jay. Right. Well, you know, talk about Nick you Chubb. know how I feel about Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb is, you know, everything personified that you want in a professional athlete. He's a leader. He just does his job. He doesn't talk. He's not a look at me guy. He's always going to work hard. Um, you can center a game plan around him. He's not going to complain. So I think having Nick Chuck, Chuck back is huge. Like I said, though, I think Wyatt Teller might be just as huge because that unit together was just so incredible the first few weeks. Um, if like we've talked about a little bit tonight, it looks like we finally have a system that is coherent and there's some kind of uh, plan behind the game co- co- the, the game planning. It's not just fly by the seat of your pants by maybe sometimes it was under Freddie. So going forward to second half of the season, like Zach said, I think if we win these next two, you know, we are almost in. And then you get to see how Baker is going to react. Baker, if any one thing you can say about Baker, no matter what, is he's a gamer. Right. He is a gamer. And I, I, I'm just fascinated to see if the Browns do go to seven and three with some more winnable games to come. How Baker plays once you hit one of those big games, once you get to the Monday Night Ravens game, once you get to the get week 17 against the, the Pittsburgh Steelers at home, how Baker reacts in those big situations, um, how Kevin Stefanski reacts in those big situations, how this team 
comes together for those games. It's just going to be a fascinating scenario. And I agree hundred percent with Zach. And I think me and you have talked about this chase is I don't think the Browns, I think they see us making the playoffs this year as a bonus. I think they wanted to develop an identity. They wanted to develop a culture and they wanted to learn how to win. And if that winning leads you into the playoffs this year, that's great. The Browns know they have holes on defense. Look, they knew when Grant Delpit went down, they didn't have anybody like Joe Wood said at the time. They could do the things that he does currently on the roster that they think he could do on the roster. So, yeah, the Browns know they have holes. But when you start to develop a winning culture and you win some games and the players get a taste of it and you get to the playoffs, um, it, it sets a tone. And then going into the offseason, they look to fill the holes they have on defense. And this becomes a more defense centric offseason. So I, I'm I'm just just fascinating to see the second half of the season, how Baker reacts to big games and how the team grows to finish out. Zach, will, will Chubb be on a, like a carry limit on Sunday or are they looking just to unleash the beast all the way? Yeah. I mean, I would think so. And like everything would point to a guy that big with a knee injury mm-hmm. needing some time to work his way back, but he's not human. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Right. But yeah. You again, they, but that's a little thing. Like you would think that they've targeted this right away, right? Like initial timeline, six weeks, it'll be exactly six weeks. Yeah. Like, okay, let's get him back. Let's test him. Doctors say good. All right, well, let's play him, but let's make sure that he's not going over 16, 18 carries. Right. Which look, looking back at the couple of games, they had Kareem Hunt, who I thought they were doing a great job of mixing it up right. and getting them both involved. So it's not like we have to, there's a pressure to chub, 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 chub. Like we have, we have Hunt to be able to carry that load. Yeah. I mean, listen, Kareem Hunt is a great running back. Yeah. So you've seen just how unique Nick Chubb is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Kareem is leading the league in 10, 10 plus yard runs with mm-hmm. 20 of them. Nick Chubb is leading the league in 20 plus yard runs with six of them. And he hasn't played. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. And we've, nice. we've talked about this, that exact thing, Zach, I've said is Kareem hunt is an awesome running back, but, it, but, just shows how actually good Nick Chubb is, how special he is. And who would have thought that when they, you know, I was actually, you know, you know, I kind of major in being wrong, Zach, as you pointed out a lot in the past. <laughs> My batting average is low. And there was another one when we drafted. I'm like, oh, this is too high. He's, he's an average running back. And here we go again, me admitting I'm wrong again. Nick Chubb may be the best, you know, one of the top five football players in the NFL. I think, I mean, think about how that played out, right? The Patriots, who are like the smartest organization of all time, take Sonny Michelle with a knee <laughs> yeah, condition right? and not as good as Nick Chubb. The Browns liked Rashard Penny and Nick Chubb. Seattle takes Rashard Penny out of nowhere, right? Then the Browns take Austin Corbett, <laughs> and then they take Chubb, and right, and he's one of the best players in the league. Incredible. So sometimes it just works. It's almost out. like we backed um, into that one, huh? <laughs> well, right, and. And, you know, we'll see, like, honestly, him coming back is a reminder that his contract situation looms yep. and it's not an easy decision either way, even though he's like the perfect kid and the perfect player. And this is the first time he's been hurt in five years and all that stuff. Right. But like identity, you know, Cameron said it. Um, it's right. Like this team has to run the ball because that's where its best players are. Right. Mm-hmm. And that opens things up for the quarterback and that helps out your struggling defense. So yeah, I mean, Nick Chubb, pitch count or no pitch count, Kareem Hunt, fresh, Wyatt Teller back. Like, I think in three weeks they'll be running the ball and putting themselves in position to win games. We've talked a lot about the offense with, for good reason, with Chubb, Hunt, Baker, OBJ. It's been on a lot of the uh, just, you know, conversation. Uh, before we get to the second half of the season, I do want to spend time on the defense, and we've mentioned how awful they are, but – I think we have two really, really, really special players in Miles Garrett and Denzel Ward. And I want to ask this question. Um, are those the best defensive players the Browns have had in this new expansion era? Like, is, is that an overreaction or is that fair to say, Cameron? What do you, what do you think? What do you think to that? I think Miles Garrett, that's, that's not an overstatement at all. I mean, he's, he's one of the, Miles Garrett to me is one of those generational talents. It just, mm-hmm. you don't, you can't, compare him to anybody else he's just he's really really good and he's getting even better um so no I don't think that's an understatement Denzel Ward I think is going to be incredible and I'm really excited to see his progress um but I yeah I mean I I can't think of anyone better that the Browns have had on defense than Miles Garrett specifically because and that maybe that's just me being you know short-sighted here and just <laughs> focusing on how great he is in this moment but i just i'm not seeing it so, well zach we, we started looking at corners and you think prime ward against prime hayden against prime mccutcheon and you're like i i would still rather have ward zach is is, is, that, is that am i wrong 
Well, yeah, from a talent standpoint, Dalen is not in the discussion of those guys. <laughs> Dalen was a great player and, and a tough as nails player. Um, Joe Hayden's had a great career and is, you know, he and Ward are, are a little different in their playing mm-hmm. styles, but yeah, I mean, put it this way. I don't know what's going to happen with the Nick Chubb thing. And I don't know what the right answer is, even though I think it's, it's pay him, mm-hmm. but I know right now that as long as Denzel Ward's healthy, it's pay him because, you know, obviously on this defense, he sticks out because there's a lot of guys that don't belong out there, but you just, you don't find guys like that. Like he is playing like a top pick in the draft where he yeah. was drafted should, right? right? Like, get in, you show off your talent, you refine your game, you add strength. And by year three or four, like you've put it all together and he's put it all together. So I don't know if he's the third best corner in the league, the 10th best corner in the league. I know he's in that range. Right. And I know that the Browns are not going to find another guy like him or, I mean, if they do great. Right. But like you need him going forward as you look at all these question marks across your defense and then potentially at the game's most important position, you can't take a position like corner that is so important in today's game and you never have enough of them. Like you have to lock Denzel Ward up and you just have to keep coaching him up and let him continue to reach his potential. He wasn't 21 years old when the day he was drafted. I mean, his, his whole career is still in front of him. Mm-hmm. Jeremy, Miles, Denzel, are they the best yeah, Browns I mean, with, uh, defenders? With all due respect to Jameer Miller and Dalen McCutcheon, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, they are the two best players in the expansion, at least the two most talented. Okay. We can I guess there still remains what, what happens with their careers and stuff to be seen going forward. But yeah, I think they're probably the two most talented defenders we've had. And I agree with Zach a hundred percent. Look, he's a prime time player at a prime time position, a position that's tough to get prime players. They go high in the draft, right? I mean, I, right along with rush defensive ends as a lockdown corner. So I think you have to lock him up. And I would bet the Browns probably are more sure they're going to lock him up than they're going to lock up Baker currently. I think they're probably more sure about <laughs> Intel than they're about Baker at this time. So, yeah, I, I think they are the two best players. Like, like Zach said, there's so many glaring holes that maybe you, you overlook at times just how good Denzel has been. Um, but uh, yeah, I think they are the two best most at least best talents that we've had since 99 on defense. So, so w- with all that said, Jay, I, I don't feel like they're still in this. Can we win this figured out for next year? I, I feel like the window for the Browns but, to really make a move is now and next year. Right. And that's, well, it. yeah, that, like, and Zach kind of alluded to this earlier. What is long-term in the NFL? Long-term in the NFL is three years. So over this next year, they, they learn to win this year. They get their system in implemented they try to get their culture in place and then next year they go for it next year is the year you you know it's a step-by-step process in the nfl you get to the playoffs this year great you learn to win this year next year they make the move to hopefully sure up the linebackers we know how they feel about linebackers maybe they don't think they're that important but you need a playmaker at that level either safety or linebacker you need someone that can smash heads and make some plays so um so, yeah, I think this coming off season they try to win this year, and this coming off season is the year they go big and try to shore up that defense. Hey, let me make one more point on Denzel. Like, he's great. He's not the best corner in his own division. That's Marlon Humphrey, That's fair. right? And then they go and get Peters to put next to him. So everything they do defensively is anything they want because it's all predicated on knowing that they trust their corners to do their job, exactly. right? So much. So everything else, all the stunts, all the blitzes, all the goofy looks they give you, they completely trust both corners to be in the right spot all the time. So that, you know, you're getting there. Like you look right now and this goes all the way back in today's past happy NFL has changed, but you need the quarterback, you need the stud receiver, you need the stud left tackle. You need that dynamite rusher. You need that dynamite corner, right? Lay these money positions out. Like for the first time in a long time, the Browns have more than a couple. Right. So we'll see how it all evolves, but that and any blueprint of the Browns being a real contender a year from now, two years from now, four years from now, certainly to me includes miles and Denzel, because those are guys that are hard to find just as talents and, and as people too, really. Zach, that's why you and Cameron are the professionals. You're able to be objective about other people in the division where I'm just a fan with a mic and I have no respect. <laughs> like, oh, they're trash. And, Get them and, out of here. It's something else fascinating about what Zach just said is that's why the Nick Chubb question is really fascinating because you got a, a front office and a coach coach that are smart guys and they believe in like asset allocation and how many of those valuable assets when you got to lock these guys up do they want to put into the backfield they've already got cream locked up at a pretty decent deal for a couple of years and do they want to put you know 10 12 13 14 million a year 
uh, with Nick Chubb, as much as we love him and as great as he is, how much do they value running back? And, you know, do they think they can just get another one and put him in there? It's going to be very interesting next couple of years. So Cameron wrap up uh, how you feel about the Browns at this exact moment in, in two words, kind of do that. And then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll head to kind of like the final half of the season here. Um, but in two words, Cameron Justice, how do you feel currently about the Browns, about where they stand? Cautiously optimistic. Okay. All right. Jeremy, two words about the Browns right now, where they stand. Playoff contenders. Ooh. Zach, you got two words for us? Completely defenseless. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. That's uh, – right, so we got eight more games, That's a Zach. Seven more weeks. Zach now. Jackson answer right there, boy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, it's hard not to get really, really cautiously optimistic, Cameron, to use your words, looking at the schedule, uh, one, two, three, four, five of the teams have, uh, losing records. None of those five teams have more than three wins. Um, the, the toughest games on the schedule, 13 away at Tennessee, Monday night, 14 week, 14 against the Ravens. And then week 17 home against the Steelers. Cameron, I, can the Browns win more than 11 games this year? Can we go six and eight? Six and eight. We can go six and eight. I can assure you that. I don't listen. I, I at this point, me cautiously optimistic. Uh, looking at the schedule ahead, I just, and a lot of it is based off of what we've seen before. Um, and I know that you can't hold that against them. You can't hold the pass against them. It's a new season, but you know, History, history has a way of uh, kind of shaping your opinion. So me being cautiously optimistic, I, I can see this Browns team going and, and, and winning five more games. Yep. Yeah, I, I think that, that's, that, that's a safe bet, Cameron. I, you know, I don't know if it's a bold bet, but we're, we're not, I'm not trying to be bold. <laughs> that, that's safe. Uh, Jeremy? How are you feeling about that schedule? Can the Browns win more than 10 games this well, year? And, you know, in the NFL, you say they'll probably win one. They should lose. And they'll probably lose one. They should win. Um, I think nine and seven is really realistic. I think 10 and six is very possible. Um, but like I said, they could they'll probably, you know, drop one to the Eagles and then beat the Titans, something like that in typical NFL fashion. So I'll say, yeah, I think uh, 10 and six, uh, uh, looking at the schedule and all things considered, you know, like Z I think Zach said earlier, nothing is guaranteed in the COVID world. You never know who might be on a, you know, COVID list in a couple weeks, but I say looking at it as it stands right now, I think 10 and six is possible. Zach, would you agree? Yeah. I mean, uh, all I will say is the 10 and six gets you in and, and I definitely think this team can go five and three again in the back half of the season. So, you know, will they, will the defense hold up, you know, how will we evaluate things? I don't know, but yeah, I, I, I it's possible. Like I, I would pick them to make the playoffs right now. And to me, it's that's 10 wins to do that. So, so yeah, my answer would be yes. Week 10 at home. They have two home games after the bye, which is, which is a gift against the Texans and the Eagles, which is even a bigger gift. Um, the Texans obviously in turn with Romeo Cornell, uh, the Browns haven't played the Texans. Well, the past couple of years, they got crushed in Houston. Uh, I think a couple of years ago or last year. When, when was that? Was that, that was Baker's rookie year, right? That was after the Jets game, I think. Yeah, they early December of Baker's rookie year, they they had a nice little run going, and they went to Texans to Houston and got blown out. Yeah, um, home against the Eagles, who are a, a little frisky, and and maybe their their D line will cause some trouble. Um, and then away at Jacksonville, uh, guys, if we if we run off three straight wins there, I mean. Let's just run the freaking table. Let's go, Zach. Let's do it, man. <laughs> yeah, I'll be, I'll be. I've been waiting to cover a playoff game. Man. Oh. I've been really happy. So. <laughs> You've been waiting a long so, time. Long so what time. would it take for the Browns to host a playoff game? We're not getting the, the one or two seed, but can we host a wild card weekend? I well, mean, under yeah. the normal format, you would have to win the division. So if, if the format changes, then the division winners will still be in, but they won't necessarily host. So it would take that. And the only way the format would change is if it's um, if games are lost to COVID, right? So, no, they're not catching the Steelers. And no, they're not ready to win the division. So, let, seems let me fun. jump in, Zach. Have you heard anything about this? Did you hear Troy Aikman? I can't remember which game he was calling. It was this week or last week. Say that he heard rumors that they might add an eighth team this year just because of the situation. Yeah, it's actually going to be voted on. Okay, Jeremy, I, so. I haven't, hadn't seen. Yeah, but 
it's going to be voted on as a contingency. And the contingency is, you know, as, the, as we go through this, and if games are lost, an eighth team is added in the format. Uh, gotcha, okay. If games aren't lost, then it just sticks with gotcha. seven. So, yeah, I, I mean, I was on another podcast earlier tonight, and I said, to me, it's too early to start doing the scoreboard watching and the what if, what, right? But, like, if the Browns are a playoff team, you mentioned it. Like, we know who the next three games are, right? Two at home and one in Jacksonville who's not trying to win. Mm-hmm. So, like, if the Browns are really an improving team and, and really going to come out of the gate and play well and maintain this focus and go after it, then we're going to know. And then in December, you can scoreboard watch and look and say, we need this team or, or we, you know, we need this here. But right now, it's just post your wins, and they're going to be favored the next three. So Zach's we'll trying to tell us how to do our podcast. We're scoreboard watching, man. Come yeah. on. This is, we want to go to the playoffs. The Browns didn't get much help on their bye uh, – the, the Raiders did lose, which is okay. The Dolphins ended up winning. Really, it's between the Raiders, Dolphins, Browns, and Colts. Am I missing anyone in there? Not now. You're not. No, no. I think that uh, okay. things could change. Yeah, but yeah. Um, and the Browns uh, just win, baby. We just win, like Zach said. It'll take care of itself. <laughs> win the next three, and it'll take care of itself. <laughs> uh, we did lose to the Raiders, so that we're we're losing a tiebreaker there. Um, and we, uh, we do have a very very favorable uh, we did beat the we did beat the colts yeah very favorable schedule um jeremy uh did you give a prediction a schedule prediction uh record here for the last eight games yeah i think i think five and three i think we'll win one that we think we should uh lose and we'll lose one we think we should win so i'm just gonna say five and three cameron did you uh give a prediction there yeah five wins five and three five wins Man, you guys are boring, zach. <laughs> zach do you have a uh kind of product uh Record prediction for the last half of the season? Yeah, I mean, I hesitate. You know, I, I think it, these next few games are not blocks because the defense, to me, has been that bad. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I do expect a really good effort this week. I expect the Browns to win. You know, what's up with Philly getting healthy? Who's even going to be playing for Jacksonville? You know, I don't know. Are you going to get to play all these in order? All There's a lot of variables. But, you know, I think this is just a huge game on Sunday. And the Browns can say, look, we, we were flat and we were – we were banged up and, and the Raiders beat us flat out beat us for three quarters of that game. So kind of get that one back in a different way and, you know, set the whole course. And then you're back in the mix. You're on the right side of it. You're playing at home again. Like, you know, yeah. momentum's finicky, but I think it is real. And there's just certain games along the schedule you have to win in a home game over a team, a home game against a team coached by Romeo Cornell is a game you have to win. <laughs> yeah. right so uh zach are you gonna say five and three as well or are you gonna yeah I'll, I'll, say, I'll say five and three i mean we don't know what the circumstances are going to be for the ravens and the steelers they're probably going to need those games right and the browns haven't shown they're ready to compete there yet but mm-hmm. it's you know again that's that's five weeks from tonight a lot can and probably will happen with who's available and what's at stake by the time they play the uh the ravens that is fair. Well, I'm not going to say five and three because that's boring. And I think we're going to do better than that. Here we go. We're going to go seven. And oh one after my the gosh. Bike. <laughs> seven and one. Our, our loss is going to come against Tennessee in Nashville. Uh, I just, this is seven and one. We're going to be 12 and four. That's the 12 and, four. Ever and, heard. and, and you you've heard it here first. Things. That's why we love you, Chase. That's why we love you. <laughs> uh it's okay just as we keep winning you're like man chase man he was right again um hey you know what jeremy picked him to go 12 and 4 4 in 2017 i did did. all right let me let let me say this let me say this do you remember this zach the last time no two years ago when you were on at the bye week chase actually predicted that run that we went on and uh and uh baker's rookie year and we both kind of laughed at him they were right before that we remember that he was on right before they went out and beat Arizona and then they went out or I'm sorry beat Atlanta beat Cincinnati beat Denver Carolina yeah you predicted all that so we got to give you some props well, I would I would say this that that's not the only precedent for like a second half of a season being completely different than a first for a team right right yeah. I mean you you just don't know uh-huh. you got to stay healthy yep. and and there's in this league there's too many good coaches there's too much information like if you're good at something teams are going to take that away no. right if you're not good at something, you got time to get better at it. So, so we'll see between now and January. And you know what? Half the battle always is Chase. Sorry, in the NFL, is getting to the halfway point above 500. Because when you're above 500, you know 
maybe players nagging injuries don't just quit the season. They try to get back, you know, they try to keep playing as opposed to just shutting it down. The Browns just never get to the point where we have a winning record halfway through the season. And that's kind of half the battle in the NFL. Get to the halfway point with a winning record and we'll see what happens down the stretch. When you're two and six going in, you know, every single freaking year at this time, you know, it, it's tougher. Obviously, it makes it tougher. So being five and three right now in a position, you know, I think it momentum wise and everything else pushes us forward. And that, that's where we got to be. Finally, we're there. I know the odds are probably stacked against them going seven and one, <laughs> but I don't think it's completely out of the realm. No, of possibility. I mean, nothing. Like, you know, it's, it's the NFL. A, a schedule. We play the Ravens, the Steelers at home. Um, and Baker's had success against both teams. Um, the last time the Steelers were in Cleveland, we all know what happened there. So I don't know. I, I just think it's possible. It's going to be fun to root for and fun to shove it in, in all your faces. When, <laughs> when you do this thank you, Chase. And it, it's going to be good stuff. Uh, Zach, thank you so much for coming on our pod again, brother. Where can we uh, catch you and read your stuff, man? That's, that's- uh, are you, I'll see you guys at the Super Bowl, right? <laughs> yeah, yes. I'll put, yeah. Uh, uh, on The Athletic every day on Twitter at Akron Jackson and occasionally on a to Z podcast.com. Look, wonderful. And look, Chase, there's a good chance uh, that vaccine is going to be ready by Super Bowl time. So maybe we maybe we can all get down there and meet up when the Browns are playing in Tampa, right? Yeah, man, for sure, for sure. Uh, Cameron, any final thoughts? Yeah, just really, really stoked for the Browns to have all these guys back. And yeah, I cannot. The, the bye week was was a little different. I'm ready to get back to Browns coverage. <laughs> It was sad. Jeremy. Yeah, no, I, you I agree with there? Cameron. I've been looking forward to getting Wyatt Teller and Nick Chubb back in the lineup to see if we go back to playing some bully ball and, uh, and, you know, our two headed monster at running back. So I'm pretty excited about that. Be down there again. Keep my streak going here and uh, excited. Well, Zach, again, thank you so much. And we'll catch you guys in a couple of days for our preview episode. against the Houston Texans. Here we go. Brownies. Here we go. Ooh, ooh. Let's get it's it. Awesome.